one of my very favorite places to go photograph and just to be here in California is the ancient bristlecone pines forest up in the White Mountains. Every year I try to make at least one workshop that we can go, we can stay there, we can photograph, we can have a good time. This year, 2017, I want to take you with me to come along on this. So I'm getting packed now and then we'll head north. We're going to head out of San Diego north. We'll go up 15 um, by Riverside up to Victorville where we'll take 395, head north to the turnoff to Ridgecrest and then turn east into Ridgecrest. After dinner, what we're going to do is go out of Ridgecrest almost due east. In Ridgecrest, it doesn't seem like it, but we really are going east. And we're going to go over to the turnoff for the Trona Pinnacles and take the dirt road down toward those pinnacles. Here's an overview uh, on that road. We'll come down that road, stop. We'll take a quick look. The pinnacles are down here. And then once we've shot some overview stuff, then we're going to go down into there and set up and do some evening shooting. Let's see what we've got. We've got uh, Jim's view of the overlook from where we were. He was able to pick up some of that late evening light, bring it out in the print. This is very nice. The uh, pinnacles are definitely showing up nicely against the background. The sky is a big part of it. It's a nice composition. It's nice that you used enough of the clouds. It's so easy to try to run the horizon right across the middle and have it be pretty boring. But this is good. This is a very nice job. What else do we have here? Well, here's Carol's shot of the uh, area where we stopped to shoot. What a mysterious looking place. This looks like something you'd find in Mordor. Um, with Sauron looking down on you going, ooh, boy, you guys are in such trouble. Nice feel. Has a really interesting emotion to the shot. It makes these rocks look like some ancient castle or fort up on the uh, top of this hill. Very cool. Ah, Jerry did an infrared shot. Um, from the same spot. It's a really interesting feel, an interesting look to it. The way the infrared picks up that reflected sunlight off of the light pinnacles. If there were any of the blue sky showing, this infrared would have turned it virtually black. Very nice. We have an interesting wide panorama of that little pinnacle that's in the other uh, other shot, but this Sets it out there by itself in a uh, um, very interesting uh, configuration. Nice panoram. And then we have a last view looking down the uh, valley. 
over these uh, bizarre rock forms. So you guys did some interesting stuff. Very cool. Well, pretty quickly, it was time to go back. The cloud cover was so heavy, there was no night shooting to do. So we went to bed. And the next morning, we were off again. Well, Friday morning, bright and early after breakfast, we were up going from Ridgecrest ultimately to the Mount Whitney uh, portal picnic area. So first we went north on 395 to Lone Pine and then turned west at Lone Pine to start the climb up to Mount Whitney. This is an aerial view of the area. And you can see the road that has come up through Alabama Hills, winds its way up the canyon, and ultimately stops at the Whitney Portal picnic area. Unfortunately, the map put a label right over the waterfall that we're about to photograph, which was very neat. confess I'm a little bit surprised that after all of the shooting that I saw all of you doing there at the waterfall, you probably noticed yourself on the uh, video, the only waterfall shot that anyone turned in to show for this program is this one. And it's a nice shot. It shows the uh, water flowing, slow shutter speed shot, traditional fast moving water shot. While I'm here, though, I'm going to make a correction to it. It is a bit off color. The overall color cast is green um, and a little bit blue. Probably due to the overcast um, day. I'm guessing that your camera white balance was set on daylight. The clouds made it a whole lot cooler than normal. So it's off a little. But it's close. So I'm going to come and pick up the camera raw filter. Before I do, I'm going to see if there's a little bit of detail in there I can bring back in these highlights. Not much. Not much, but a little. Bring our contrast back up some. Whites back up a little. Open up our shadows a little. Oops, that's a little too much. Open those up a little. And now we'll white balance it. There we go. And now, there's our before. There's our after. So it's not a big change. Not a big change. But it opens it up a little bit for us. So after we finished at the waterfall, then it was time to head back down the hill. And we drove into Movie Road in the Alabama hills. We followed the Whitney Portal Road back to the turnoff to Movie Road. And from there, we headed back to look at a couple of places we stopped. I mean, there's shooting all over the place, but... Specifically, we looked at two places. One was the overlook, looking back towards Mount Whitney, and the other was the trailhead to Mobius Arch, uh, so you could see where that was. I confess, I love this place. And if you've never been here at dawn to watch this salmon-colored light come down the peaks, then you need to put this on your bucket list and get out here to see that. Well, 
Mark, I apologize. This shot obviously belonged in the waterfall group, but I put it in the wrong category to uh, collect here. Um, this is a really nice shot with a waterfall going on behind it. Um, nicely out of focus with long, long shutter speed, shallow depth of field. You did a nice job with this uh, pretty little flower here. When you're doing that, play with different shutter speeds. You might have gotten a different effect if you could just barely start to see the water moving uh, behind it. But try try it with both. But again, this is a nice, nice shot. Now, to my surprise, even more so than having only the now couple of waterfall shots, after watching everybody shoot lots of stuff at the uh, Alabama Hills, I'm only seeing this shot specifically from the Alabama Hills, panoram of the uh, um, hills with Mount Whitney in the background, right square in the middle, some of the foreground hills. It's a nice panoram, Jim. Did a uh, good job. You got a feel for the different types of terrain that were in there. Um, it'd be fun to go back and really work the scene some more. But an interesting panoram. Let's see what else we've uh, got. We have this scene uh, from Jerry that's of the Eastern Sierras, although I'm not exactly sure which mountain this is. I'm going to pretend like it's something that could have been shot from Alabama Hills. Maybe it was. It's a very nice shot. I'm assuming this is one of your infrared shots, the way the sky is being dealt with in the uh, haze. But again, it's really dramatic with the sense of the clouds picking up the same textures and forms that are in the rocks. So good job. Now I guess it's time to get on down the road. And when we were through there, then we went back and headed north. Well, once we left Alabama Hills, it's time to head for our real destination, which is the ancient bristlecone pines forest and our lodging at the White Mountain Research Station. So once back in Lone Pine, we headed north towards Big Pine, where we fueled up because there isn't going to be any gas once we leave Big Pine until we come back to it. At Big Pine, we turn northwest into the White Mountains. Once on the road into the White Mountains, what we're looking for is the White Mountain Road, which leads back into the bristlecone pine forests. Fortunately, it's pretty well marked. It's really a beautiful drive to get there. It was some incredible scenery once we hit the uh, Forest Service Road. The destination for our trek, the place we're going to spend the night, get fed like kings and queens by the uh, incredible Tim Forsell, is the White Mountain Research Station that belongs to the University of California Regents and is done for all kinds of high altitude research. It's off of this main White Mountain Road. But this is rugged terrain, as you can see from this satellite view of the map. And we're getting in a little bit closer to it. The turnoff now is marked with a sign. It didn't used to be, and you just had to know where you were going. But now it's pretty clear. It's easy to get into. You follow the road back. It's not quite a mile off of the main White Mountain Road. Of course, main road is a term that's used somewhat cavalierly here. Here's a closer view of the Crooked Creek Station. Right under the sign is the dining hall and the main dormitories. Off to the side are research facilities, cabins for housing, both for guests and for the staff that stays there and takes care of it. This is an incredible place and you have to be a 
member of or part of an educational facility in order to use it. That's why it's wonderful to be able to use City College as our host so that we can use this incredible facility. So here's the road in. What a beautiful place. I mean, it always excites me to be coming down this road. The main draw, I think, isn't me. It's this fellow, Tim Forsell, the cook, the manager, the person who keep, takes care of the station. What a great guy. And what a great spread he puts on in the dining room. People just love this. But we came here to photograph, not just to eat, so early next morning, off we went. Out in the meadow was Campito, this horse that has been here 26 years all alone. Pretty well fed, it looks like. Amazing animal. Tough. As we got closer to the Patriarch Grove, the trees thinned out, the dolomite grew, and the road was closed. So, didn't slow us down. Off into the trees, at this incredible altitude, you, you had to walk a little carefully. No, the student hasn't passed out. This is just for a low level shot. These are such wonderful creatures, these trees. They have been here forever. The oldest one is over 5,000 years old germinated before Alexander the Great was even born. This special tree is streaked where lightning has struck it. Lots of vistas around the ridge, clever ways to frame things, rows and rows of these tough old trees, great vistas. They all are here. Here's an apparition. Thought it was a ghost at first, but it's him shooting his uh, view camera. So let's see what you guys have shot. Well, it's pretty clear that you all took this uh, bristlecone pines trip pretty seriously. We only got a few photographs that you've already seen of the other areas, but from the bristlecone pines, wow. I have a whole pile. I have so many that it really, it would take forever to go through them all and critique them all. If you would like me to do that for yours, send me an email or let me know and I'll pick up yours specifically and go through them and, and we can talk about them. But for now, other than for just general comments, I just am so pleased with this stuff you've turned in. I want the other people to see it. There were a couple of interesting technical problems. Several of you did not carefully read the instructions about resizing when I said you must do the resolution change before you do the physical size change because the resolution will change the physical size all of its own. So I have several scattered throughout here that actually are so small that when I enlarge them to fill the screen as much as possible, they're pretty pixelated and start to come apart. I apologize for the quality. For the rest of you, believe me, some of these do not represent the very high quality imagery that was on these. And this is one of them. Uh, several of them from Carol came across a little bit small, but her eye and looking for cool stuff is really good. As a very general comment, what I would say is, Carol, I think you've got two pictures here. This one in here is really cool with this texture. And this is a fascinating little creature here. Looks like a long dead petrified creature of some kind that that also could be fun to play with. So I think this is a fun image. I might see what I could work around it to do to create a couple of shots out of it. And here we have a beautiful hillside shot, also by Carol, with this magnificent old gnarly old tree overlooking the rest of the mountains there. This shot really does represent what the White Mountains look like. Very nice shot, Carol. 
did a very good job. And this one is kind of cool, showing the living and the dead. If any part of the bristlecone pine trees has green on it, then that tree is alive. It may be barely alive, but that's, as we learned from uh, Princess Bride, almost dead is different than full dead. So this is pretty amazing, the new growth and the old wind-scarred timber all in one shot. It's a, a good call. And here again, we have a wonderful statement to this tree clinging to life. You know what scatters the bark on these is the ice crystals in the air in winter are blown with such incredible wind power that it rips the bark off. It's like being sandblasted, but instead of being blasted with sand, you're blasted with ice crystals. What a incredible environment these trees not only tolerate and seem to like but they certainly survive well in them and this this cool solo old tree on the hilltop this is very nice this also is pretty emblematic of some of these trees standing sentinel against horrible horrible conditions i think i might brighten this up just a little bit it was a cloudy day when we were there the overcast came and went there would be little holes in the clouds now and then but it was pretty much pretty overcast the entire time. So we had to make do with that. I would cheat a little on this just to bring it a little more to life, boost up the contrast a little bit, bring the highlights up and see what you could do with that. Excellent composition though. And now we're into uh, Imogene's stuff and there are some beautiful abstract wood fiber things that Imogene has done. This is really very, very nice Imogene. I love the way all of this stuff streaks through here. And then we have the little dendrite um, material over on that side. It's a very good composition. Nice job. And it works well in black and white. And here's another one. The tones and the shapes really work together in this shot. You clearly have an eye for the uh, black and white world that's out there. Yet another one by Imogene. This one combining the swirls of that fiber with the rough bark that still remains. Very nice composition. Nice move. This one is also an exceptional one. Imogen, you have some really cool images in here. All this abstract woodwork. These would make a nice body of work, by the way. You ought to consider putting this together in some collection, whether it's a book or a gallery show or something. These are very, very nice. And this one's kind of a standout. You know what these remind me of a lot are some of the work that minor white and uh, the westons did at point lobos they were dealing with rock forms and gravel and various sizes of eroded materials but your work with this wood is very similar in feel to that so i think you ought to put this together and do something with it some very nice shots here ah we have one of our uh, i believe one of our infrared shots here from jerry very cool infrared does some really fascinating things with this wood and i confess i'm a little bit surprised it must be because of the high reflection of infrared from those barkless trees i would have thought being mostly dead they might have absorbed more infrared than reflected it but wow that certainly was in error this is uh, this is very cool and here also by Jerry is a hill-topped, gnarly old veteran. Wow, what a, what a great figure. This is like the wizard with the arms outstretched and the tall peaked hat. This is a very neat tree and a very nice shot of it. You guys are doing some really amazing stuff. And I am so glad to see that some of you also got down and looked at the ground cover. It is so interesting, all of these delicate, tiny little flowers that also withstand this horrible weather the same way these gnarly old trees do. This is amazing. And this is a very colorful little tableau you've created here. Very nicely done. And then we have the single version of that nice macro shot. I love the delicate detail in these, particularly given how tiny they are. What incredibly small and yet hardy little creatures these flowers are very cool against that background i think i would come in on this a little bit make the flower a little more of the shot and i think it'll be stronger and from up in the mountains in the uh um 
Sierras, while some of us were in Alabama Hills, Jim and a couple of them went to some other locations, this one in uh, Pinion Creek, and this is a nice shot of that. The overcast day really reads in this. If this were mine, I think, again, I would cheat on it because I know how rich at times when you get down in here, how rich this color can be. Um, as the water comes over it, you get this golden, rich, russet colors in there. I would probably try to bring those out a little more. You've got up at the top a few places here and here where there are pools of light that the sun has hit. I would cheat. I would make this a pool of light and lighten it up to work like that. Mark has done some interesting things with these bristlecone pines using a partial color, partial black and white approach. And this is really very interesting to see it this way. S several of his are done this way. When it's done well, it really can work nicely. Here's an exceptional one of the brown, golden, weathered tree against a black and white backdrop. I believe that's White Mountain in the background. Um, but I'm not totally sure of that. Or it could be Barcroft. In any case, there's still a lot of snow up there. It's still pretty nippy. And here's one more. It's a twisted giant reaching into the sky. I think this is a different view of some of the trees, we've, or one of the trees, rather, we've seen before. But this is an interesting one. This twisted shape, this gnarled, twisted shape, blown that way by the wind, blowing the tree around in this spiral, allowing it not only to withstand the wind, but to shed it better in this shape than it would if it were just straight up and down, smooth on all sides. It's an amazing adaptation of nature. These trees, like I said in that first night, these trees really are miraculous. And now we get to... My friend Lee's work, this abstract of the bark on the tree, it's reminiscent of one of those early black and white shots we saw. This one is beautiful in color. I love the layout. That bottom part of the bark looks like water, looks like a wave splashing against a, a sunset sky. It was really a, an interesting, fascinating shot. Nice work. And this one, if you stand back a little, if you look close, it's just little knot holes in a tree. But if you stand back, there's a face here. It's almost like a little bear cub with the eyes here and the muzzle out here. I think the only thing, if it were mine, that I would do is trim it a little closer. I would force that face out a little more because I think it's, it's very interesting the way it looks. This is pretty cool, as it is. There are faces everywhere if you look for them, and Lee is really good at finding them. And this is a nice perspective. The idea of being able to come down low to the ground and shoot up at your subject. These trees reaching up into the sky are marvelous, particularly with that wonderful twist that they have to them. They do. He's titled this Dancer, and this tree really is dancing under the sun. It's like some of those drawings you see of the dancers in some almost distorted poses that you think, oh my God, I don't know the human body can do that. And yet there they are. And this tree is picking up on some of that same sense. <laughs> this one looks like the prow of a Viking dragon ship, almost, with the back of it being uh, burnt off in battle or blown up. It's almost as if you can see that, or you could see the waves coming up onto it, splashing onto this tree, waves of wood um, against this tree. I love this place. This, there are so many image possibilities, and you guys have done excellent, excellent work here. <laughs> and here's a nice one, looking through a tree at another. This is like a gun sight, in reverse, almost. All it needs is a little spike here for the front sight, and you've got this a natural peep sight. Very good call. I do know that he had to be down on his hands and knees to do this shot. So there's a lesson in here for the rest of you. Don't walk around at normal height and expect to see all that there is to see. Arthur Kessler said that photographers and creative people generally share the trait that they can see the familiar as strange. Well, to do that, sometimes you have to get into some strange positions in order to see it. Minor White said to his students, 
Photograph things not for what they are, but for what else they are. Well, here's a good example of that. There's an interesting uh, diptych of these two uh, forms. This could be the same tree. Now that I look at it, it is the same tree. This um, lichen dendrite stuff is the same as this. Very cool to make two out of this. Very different feelings from the same tree. It's almost as if the wood, it isn't just swirling in this one. It's tied itself into a knot. That's fascinating. This place is just endlessly fascinating. But like everything, sooner or later, the shooting was over and it's, alas, time to go home. So this last shot of Lee's of the mountains on the way out is perfect for that. This was a long trip, but a good trip. Hope you guys had as much fun at it as I did. And maybe we'll come back for another one. So, see you soon.